this was the proudest moment in my life. After the 2004 tsunami hit Sri Lanka, I went home to my town that was very badly affected by the tsunami. I went there as an expert to help my people recover after one of the world's most serious, devastating natural disasters. My role was to provide water supply and sanitation services, something which is a basic human need for us all. You know, when I was out there in my town helping my people, I realized that I was, I was actually in a very, very important profession. I am a water professional. And today, I want to share with you what inspired me to become a water professional. What inspired me was really my cultural and spiritual connection with water. As I said, I was born in Sri Lanka, and I spent a lot of time in Chennai in South India. For us, like with many other cultures, water is sacred. It's, it, we have this love for it, and it's deeply embedded in our psyche. Of course, water was a struggle, and I mean a real struggle. Imagine this, a typical night at home in Sri Lanka, in Chennai. It's dark, everyone is fast asleep, it's very silent. Suddenly the silence is broken, and the silence is broken by the sound of water passing through empty pipes and dripping from taps. It's come, the water has come. It's a very joyous moment for us all. You see, in Chennai, like in many other towns in developing countries, the water is highly unreliable. It might come every second day, or it might come every third day. And it might come at any time of the day, or even in the night. It might come for one hour, or it might come for three hours. You just don't know. But what you do know is that when the water comes, you have to be prepared. Prepared to collect as much water as you can. Because you don't know when it might come again. So when this water alarm clock goes off, we're ready. And I mean we're really ready. Everybody gets out of bed and they get into positions. My wife and her mother, their job is to try and use as much of the water that was stored previously in a wise way. So they start washing, washing clothes, washing pots and pans, and even washing the floor. My brother, my father-in-law, and myself, our role is to try and collect as much water as we can. It's not easy. We live on a second floor. And the pressure in the water pipelines is not sufficient to bring it to the second floor. So we arrange ourselves in a human chain, and we keep passing pots to each other. It's ironic, but this act of collecting water, of working as a team, really brings the family together. Together we understand the preciousness of this valuable resource. And it impacts the way in which we manage our water. You see, when we manage water, we have these principles. Principle one is doing more with less. For us, every drop of water is valuable. So when we take a bath, we don't have a running tap and water flowing to waste. We use a bucket, about 15 to 20 liters, and that's it. That's about a third of the water that we might use here in Florida. When we wash our clothes, when we wash vegetables, we do it in a container. Again, there's no water going to waste. And the added benefit is that the water left over can be reused. And that's the second principle. We try to use water as many times as possible. So the water from washing the vegetables, from washing clothes, that water is reused for flushing our toilets, for watering our plants, and for washing the floor. And that brings me on to our third principle. All water is good water. The trick 
is to match the quality of the water for its intended purpose. So for drinking and cooking, we take the water that we collected in the night, we boil it, we protect it and keep it safely. For bathing, we use some of the collected water mixed with saline groundwater. For flushing the toilet, we use the reused water from, vegetables, from, cook, from washing vegetables and washing clothes. So you see, for us, all water is good water, even wastewater. So we're very smart about the way we use water. But our attitude and behavior towards water is not about the struggle for water. We have this deep connection with the water. We treat it as a precious resource, whether we have it in abundance or not. You see, we have this deep love for water. I come from a very old and long tradition where water is sacred. It's the purifier, the life giver, the destroyer of evil, the symbol of fertility and mystery. We often symbolize God with an earth pot, with mango leaves at the neck and a coconut on top. The pot symbolizes Mother Earth. The water, life giver. The leaves, life. And the coconut, divine consciousness. It is this context in which I grew up and what directs me in the way I use water. You know, my father would say to me, he would say, we are the custodians of water. When you use water, think of it like taking a book from the library. You take it on loan, and you use it wisely for your benefit. But when you finish using it, you need to return it, and you have to return it in a condition knowing that someone else is going to use it after you. So you need to return it in a condition like you might have wanted to receive it yourself. It's this rich water tradition that inspired me to become a water professional. And so I trained as a civil engineer. And it's quite funny, when I trained as a civil engineer, I realized I'd entered into a profession whose very foundation was based on a philosophy of commanding and controlling nature for the benefit of man, something completely contrary to my own upbringing and to my traditions. In fact, if you look at the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK, of which I'm a fellow, and if you look at how they describe the profession of civil engineering in their original charter of 1828, they say that civil engineering is the art of directing the great sources of power in nature for the use and convenience of man. And you see, this is what has guided, these 19th century principles are what has guided the way in which we design and manage our water systems. We've created barriers that separate people from water. It distances them and even alienates them from the very water they treasure. These barriers are like the dams and levees that protect us from flooding, the physical and chemical treatment process that protect us from contaminants and waterborne pathogens. It's true, these barriers have provided great public health benefits and safety, but they've also distanced us from the natural water cycle that's so pivotal in our lives and in the lives of our planet. We engineer systems that are sealed units that pipe water to people so that their only contact with water is when they turn on their tap. Our public health fears mean that we use very high quality drinking water for flushing our toilets, for washing our cars and for watering our loads. But with water resources diminishing and the demand for water increasing, we're realizing that we can't continue business as usual. We realize that we need to rethink our relationship with water. And this is where I think some of the lessons can be learned from the way my family and millions of others engage with water. Remember the principles, doing more with less, 
We've started to adopt that principle in our water conservation strategies. We've started to develop very advanced water-saving devices so that we can have a shower and use less water, but still have the sensation of abundance. We've got these intelligent pipes that can repair themselves if there's a break so that we don't have wastage. Principle number two, use water as many times as you can. We've designed these clever toilets so that after you've washed your hands, that water can be used to flush your toilet. We've designed advanced technologies that can take wastewater and that that wastewater can be used to irrigate our golf courses and our parks. We do that here in Tampa. And principle number three, matching the quality of the water for its intended purposes. We're now producing designer waters, one quality designed for drinking, another quality designed for different industrial uses, and another quality designed for irrigation. They're doing this in Los Angeles, in California. So we have made progress, real progress. We've reduced our water footprint substantially. But we still take water for granted. These technologies have allowed us to still turn on our tap, flush our toilet, without thinking where the water came from or where the water is going. Let me ask you, do we really believe that we can continue to use technologies to get us out of this trouble? I don't think so. Have we really got smart about water? I don't think so. You know, when I look back and I think about the way that my family used water, they were smart not only because they applied these principles of clever water use. It was a lot more than that. They had this deep connection with the water, this deep love for the water. And I believe that if we're going to become more sustainable, we're going to have to combine our technology fixes with a change in our mind and in our heart. We're going to have to think holistically about water. We have to forget thinking about it as a commodity to serve man. We're going to have to reconnect with the water, and we're going to have to love the water. This holistic thinking is not a pipe dream. It's already happening in one of the most advanced countries in the world, Singapore, a country that has very limited water resources, but has been able to provide its people with one of the highest water services anywhere in the world. In Singapore, they use game-changing technologies to produce drinking water from seawater, to produce drinking water from wastewater. I reckon they could produce drinking water from just about anything. But at the same time, they've combined these technologies with programs that try to reconnect people with water. They've opened up their spaces so people can get close to rivers and lakes and streams. They can touch the water. They can play with the water. They can enjoy the water. They want their people to adopt and become guardians of rivers and lakes and streams. They want to inculcate a sense of ownership of this shared resource. They want their people to re-establish their historical, cultural, and spiritual connection with water. You know, here in Florida, we're not that different. We appreciate the importance of water and natural systems to our lives and to our future. Although we're not perfect, we recognize that our fragile ecosystems are what provides us with our water supplies, that provide us with the habitat that allows us to maintain this beautiful and unique wildlife. And it's what provides us with the reason that we love living here in this state. If we are to be more sustainable in Florida, we have to stay true to both the necessity but also the inspiration of our relationship with water. When I think about what epitomizes the city of the future, for me, it's a place where people live with nature and use technologies to facilitate that living. Let's always be a place where people take better care of their water because we appreciate its value, 
both rationally and spiritually. So we can more easily return the book of water to the library of the river. We need to get smart about water. And this is why. Thank you very much. Thank you.